This week, the Confederacy creates territory and a major battle in Kentucky. On the 18th, the CSA organizes the territory of Arizona. All parts of the New Mexico Territory south of the 34th parallel are part of this territory. Its capital is in Mesilla, and its governor is Colonel John R. Baylor. The next day, the very main news of this week, the Battle of Mill Springs, Kentucky. Last week, we spoke of the Battle of Middle Creek. It was just a small part of a major general offensive being conducted by the Army of the Ohio. As part of this offensive, Army is to be split up, attack poorly defended areas, then reform in case of a Confederate army threatening a small section of that army. On the 17th, Brigadier General George H. Thomas left Lebanon for Logan's Crossroads. There he hopes to link up with Brigadier General Avon Shoeth. But during this time, the rain falls hard, and it actually gives time for the Confederacy under Major General George B. Crittenden an idea. He can attack Thomas's force before Shoeff can show up. He could open up a hole in the Union line, cause the entire Union campaign backwards. The Union for this battle will have 4,400 men under Brigadier General George H. Thomas. They're actually split up into three infantry brigades, the 2nd, 3rd, and 12th, along with some artillery. The 2nd Brigade is led by Colonel Manson, with the 10th Indiana, 4th Kentucky, and 14th Ohio. The 3rd Brigade is under Colonel McCook and has the 2nd Minnesota and 9th Ohio Infantry. The 12th Brigade is under Colonel Carter with the 12th Kentucky, 1st and 2nd Tennessee, and the 1st Kentucky Cavalry. There are also have batteries B and C of the 1st Ohio Artillery and the 9th Ohio Artillery. The Confederates have 5,500 men and are under Major General George Crittenden. Groups are in two brigades. The first is under Brigadier General Felix Solokoffa. You might remember him from battles in 1861. It is made up of the 15th Mississippi, 19th and 20th and 25th Tennessee, and Tennessee Artillery, and some cavalry with a company of cavalry from Kentucky. The second brigade is under Brigadier General William Henry Carroll. It is made up of the 16th Alabama, 17th, 20th, and 29th Tennessee, 4th and 5th Tennessee Cavalry, and some Tennessee Artillery. The Confederate Army begins their march to battle on the 9th of the 18th. Rain slows their march down and dampens their powder. Not only does the Confederacy lose the night attack, they also lose the surprise attack. They commence their attack with energy and gusto, but in broad daylight and well known. But despite this, they achieve some very early successes. The 15th Mississippi and 20th Tennessee are at the head of the assault, engaged for an hour with the 10th Indiana and 1st Kentucky Cavalry. The unit is forced back due to just the fight, but also low ammo, but are luckily saved by the 4th Kentucky giving time for the 10th Indiana to resupply and get back into the fight. For this early success was the Confederates were attacking from the cover of the woods. But this is also a liability. It leads to miscommunication. Zolkoff mistakes the 4th Kentucky for a Confederate regiment and runs up to them. He's shot by Colonel Fry, the leader of the 4th Kentucky, and dies on the spot. The 4th Kentucky then compounds the problems with the Confederacy by laying down heavy volley after volley onto the Zolkoff's brigade forcing it backwards. The other Confederate regiments in the area then focus their attack on the 4th Kentucky, but Colonel Fry is in a very good position and can't be dislodged. Major General Crittenden then takes direct control of Zollicoffer's brigade. He tells Brigadier General Carroll to advance. They don't have time for these setbacks. Crittenden is gambling here. The attack has seemingly been stalled. But he can't wait for his soldiers to reorganize because the Union could then be reinforced by Shoah. And he can't withdraw, knowing he have lost men for nothing. Rise the Confederates advance again, Rear General Thomas of the Union arrives and prepares a counterattack. With the fresh 2nd Minnesota and 9th Ohio, the day will be won. The oratory opens up and decimates the Confederates' attack, opening up for a Union time to strike. The 2nd Minnesota increases the rate of fire, suppressing the Confederate infantrymen. 9th Ohio then advances with bayonet outwards, and the 2nd Minnesota, not to be outdone, gets very close to the enemy. So close, in fact, Colonel McCook wrote, The enemy and the 2nd Minnesota were poking their guns through the same fence. Now, 
The main union line will act as follow. On the far right, 9th Ohio, 2nd Minnesota, and the 4th Kentucky in the rear. 10th Indiana on the front line, 2nd Tennessee, and 12th Kentucky ending the line on the far left. This is important because the union line will now take the fight directly to the Confederacy, harshly. The 9th Ohio is actually all alone on the Union right slash Confederate left but it smashes in a Confederate flank. The 9th Ohio trusted in their bayonet, men, and just charged straight forwards. While being outnumbered by the Confederacy, the Ohioans just do it. They have the gusto, and the Confederate muskets don't fire. Wet powder. The 9th destroys multiple Confederate regiments. The Confederates aren't ready for this end break, withdrawing to Carthage, Tennessee. Though two regiments, an Alabama and one Tennessee, hold, stopping the Union forces for a little bit before withdrawing. This actually is very important, unless for the Confederates to withdraw safely. Major General Kennedy can't stop the withdrawal. Follows men, powerless and without a good second in command. The Union loses around 39 men and 207 wounded. The Confederates lose 125 dead and 404 wounded or missing. While those who are seriously wounded are left to the Union. Major General Crittenden is accused of being a drunk and a traitor. His army is disbanded, and he becomes a corps commander under Brigadier General Simon Buckner. The Confederate defensive line in eastern Kentucky has been broken. He has undisputed control of the region. The question that remains, though, what of western Kentucky? On the 20th, Secretary of War Edwin Stanton is sworn in. He immediately starts meeting with Congressman, First Representative John Potter, Chairman on the Committee on Loyalty of Federal Employees. Potter gave Secretary of War Cameron a list of 50 people to fire. Stanton fires four of them on his first day. This actually starts a very strong relationship between Stanton and said committee. He then meets with Senator Benjamin Wade, who strengthened his relationship with the chairman on the Joint Committee on the Conduct of the War. The committee has subpoena power, among many other powers, and Stanton wants to use it. Stanton then also asks Congress to stop promotions before he can review the more than 1,400 that have piled up on his desk. This leads to promotions being more merit-based and less political. Though with the loss of Cameron, Stanton wants to make sure that Pennsylvania stays strong with the administration, so he gets John Tucker, an executive at the Philadelphia and Reading Railroad, as his assistant secretary, along with an old lawyer ally. Stanton also expands the department. This includes hiring more than 60 people. He wants to make sure the department can quickly react to any problems need be from the Congress, or from the Army. In just a few days, Stanton has seemed to reform the department and help stabilize the civilian war effort. It's almost breathtaking how much he has done. And on the 22nd, the Confederacy raises premiums on recruitment. This is an obvious sign. The Confederacy just needs more men. And it is definitely a need. The Confederacy doesn't have a lot of money already, so using part of their low supply and recruitment is a very risky gamble for the breakaway state. But, let's return to Sickles. Though Stanton is a strong ally and dear friend, he still needs congressional support to get his commission. Sickles is a Democrat, and Congress isn't the biggest fan of Democrats right now. There's fears from congressmen that Democratic generals will just desert. Maybe some, but not Sickles. And there's another question. Slavery. Sickles does not like slavery. He doesn't return runaway slaves but abolitionists don't realize the side of Sickles. So people like Senator Wilson of Massachusetts believe that Sickles is capturing runaway slaves and returning them to plantations. And those in Maryland like Senators Kennedy and Pierce know Sickles is letting and helping runaway slaves and won't vote for his commission. Sickles is following Hooker's line, though. We are men of the U.S. volunteers, not slave catchers. Sickles is a man of ideals, not a politician, at least anymore. That's where the week ends. Mill Springs, Mill Springs, Mill Springs. Mill Springs is the biggest battle since Wilson's Creek, and the first major Union victory. As I said earlier, the Union has broken the Confederate battle line in control of eastern Kentucky. Lincoln is pleased. The Union may have played the defensive in this battle, but it's just a small part of the great general offensive. And there are others who are taking advantage of it. Rear General Grant has been asking for permission from Major General Halleck to attack western Kentucky and western Tennessee. And this victory could get him to go ahead. This victory could just be the first domino to fall in the Western Theater. Before I get to the normal and please like, comment, subscribe part of the exit, I would personally like to thank the Warhawk channel. 
Warhawk is a community of historians who create small documentaries on the major battles of the Civil War. They also have a Mill Springs battle. It's really good. They're really nice. You should check them out. Link in the description. Hello, it's the entire Civil War Week by Week team here. That is a weird motto to have. And I want a new outro. So if you liked the video, please like it. If you want to see more, you should be seeing suggested videos right about now. And if you want to know what happens next week, please subscribe. And if you want to share history, give me suggestions in a more easy way than YouTube comments, or want to tell me how wrong I am, please check out the channel's Discord.